Yo, hello, hello, welcome to the elephant in the room. This is part 4 of the chapter 5 of the book The Origin of Most Problems. So, welcome back. This is now about how societies change and what pushes a society to change. Because you know, it doesn't happen overnight. It never has. And also, I think it's, it's not working if we somehow invent a new kind of society, maybe on an island or another continent, alongside our current system. I think it doesn't work. Because history proves that things change over time. Societies are not invented, they evolve. Like it happens in small steps here and there and takes a long period of time. For example, the agricultural revolution where people um, changed from being hunter-gatherers and became farmers. That also didn't happen overnight. It was a long process, took small steps here and there, but then in turn changed the society. And another example is the internet who wasn't suddenly implemented everywhere much rather it um, got invented then it was implemented maybe here maybe there and then it slowly spread and became what it is today because of course it also changes the society then um, like the way we communicate the way we interact so um, yeah it takes a long time and basically the trump superhero says that in essence two things change societies technology and ideas and they are married to each other. Like science is a bunch of ideas that gives rise to technology like microwaves, electricity, AC, artificial hearts or whatever. And these technologies change ideas in turn. Because of the advancement in science, technology, we change the way we see death for example. Someone is not declared dead anymore if they do not breathe or his or her heart stops because they could be resuscitated today within a time frame. The other example is the internet, which basically changed completely the way we live. Like if you go back in time 100 years ago and you tell people, you will be able to communicate with other people from the other part of the world, like instantly, with those small tiny gadgets, they would probably be completely freaked out, wouldn't be able to understand you and probably also feel uncomfortable with this idea um, because it was just it's not normal these days but nowadays it's just a normal thing that people use those tiny gadgets and um, another example are cars like also 200 years ago there were no cars so people might be scared even of cars or feel uncomfortable using cars but now it's just a normal thing and if we now think about ourselves, like imagine going into a capsule, you become unconscious for 10 minutes, but then you will reach um, any kind of destination on planet Earth. Maybe that also feels uncomfortable for you, but if the transportation system works that way in the future, then it will also be just a normal thing for us. And now what is interesting, if I'm just thinking about autonomous cars is, um, because, yeah, you know, I live in Germany and <laughs> many Germans are so proud of their cars. And I can imagine, like, if you ask them, would you want an autonomous car, they would be like, no, I want to fucking drive my own car. But, um, yeah, in the future, that might be also not normal anymore and people will only use autonomous cars. Like, of course, it makes much more sense. I mean, if you look nowadays, these cars that people are using are only used by them, so by one or two people, like in the average, and also stand around for 23 hours a day and being used just for one hour probably. So it's just a, a completely waste of resources if we think about it and complete madness like if we think about the world. Um, so yeah, people might be able to see the benefits of just like going into an autonomous car, going to wherever you want to go without worrying or stressing about the traffic, about traffic lights or anything like that. 
But now, like if we think about the game of trade and we continue down this path, then I can see already how Google provides these so-called free cars, autonomous cars for people, but um, they put ads in those cars and people have to trade their attention in order to um, have access to those cars. That's how I see the future with all that attention economy and I can imagine that many companies come up with something like this. Um, let's get back to the book. The Trump superhero is saying this state of being comfortable with a particular way of living thinking is pushed by ideas and technology. He is elaborating when more and more jobs get automated that pushes our society to rethink the labor for income idea. And this in turn, the idea that humans perhaps should not work in order to get what they need and want, thus possibly changing their society. And another example are kings in the past who basically decided for the society um, and then humans came up with this idea called democracy. So they tried to, or well, yeah, said that people should have the power and um, yeah this idea spread like crazy even though we can see that it's pretty inefficient like imagine if science is done with democracy i have this opinion no i have this opinion no science is about facts and evidence and what works and what not so yeah but still like uh, um like um, celebrating this democracy idea and going on the street and saying we need more democracy so yeah the trump superhero says yes it is ironic that still a few modern kings the politicians and corporations decide for the masses but that idea of democracy spread and got adopted then here we got it visually so like problems indeed push for solutions and these solutions come in the form of technology and ideas problems um, lead to ideas and technology like in the case of infectious diseases um, people came up with the germ theory of disease and microscopes and Trump Subir is saying that's how it works. This is how societies change their structure of governing, their values, their habits. Now he is saying we are in a very fortunate position with our trade enemy because of several reasons. The first point is our enemy is easy to define and it creates the vast majority of the world's problems. Forget about market systems, capitalism, free markets, other isms, federal reserve banks or other complicated economical gibberish. They are all the babies of trade and trade is very easy to get your head around. We can touch this monster ghost, we know who it is, anyone can see it very clearly. The second point is our enemy is only a red flag. Basically, if you look at other attempts to change the society, other ideas, they try to push a way of living onto humanity. We should all own the means of production, we should not have leaders, we should declare the earth's resources as common heritage, we should invent certain laws about what people are allowed to do or not to do, we should do this or not do that. They rarely, if ever, work because they try to superimpose a value system onto humans. When I say we should get rid of trade, then I do not say how we should do things. I only point out what will probably create issues in our society. And it is up to people if they accept living with this problem or not. Much like a doctor will point out that cancer is killing humans, but does not force a treatment onto humans. I do not say games should be less competitive, movies should be less dumb, books should be more scientific and kids should not spend so much time in front of computers. I do not impose anything onto anyone. I am just pointing out that in the game of trade games become competitive and harmful, movies become dumb for the sake of making profits in an easy way, books are poorly written for the same reasons and kids are mined for their attention and data by big companies. Now, if people understand this and they still want to continue living in this manner, then it is up to them. Therefore, 
Focusing on trade as our enemy is merely a showcasing of what creates problems. It is not superimposing any way of living onto anyone. This approach is as good as the open source approach where they do not invade people's way of living. They merely point to a problem, proprietary software, and they do not ask people to create a particular type of open source software. It's up to people what and whether they create. Let's be honest, the world does not need holding hands and daddying. The thing is, we have the knowledge and capabilities to feed everyone on earth, to provide healthcare for all, to build amazing and self-sustainable buildings or transportation systems. Doctors know how to fix people, engineers know how to build efficient buildings, programmers know how to create secure and complex software and so forth. NASA knows very well how to handle science missions to other planets, Doctors Without Borders know how to manage disease outbreaks and Linux knows how to create a stable operating system. We already live in an extremely knowledgeable and capable society, but this infectious disease called trade fucks everything up. That's why our mission should be to take trade away from this society if we wish to greatly improve it and not try to reorganize our society from the ground up. So making people aware of the problem called trade is what the Trump superhero does. The third point is our enemy opens the door for realistic solutions. The Trump superhero is saying in the Trump documentary he pointed out to a solution called resource-based economy described by the Venus project. Although a very interesting set of ideas it leaves us with uncharted territory ahead. What should I, the one knowing about such a solution do? The Venus project proposes a big massive undertaking by planning to build a test city to showcase their solution. This may or may not be possible to accomplish, but even if it may be a good idea or not, it leaves everyone in limbo waiting for the big city, the big plan to put into effect. It is an all eggs in one basket approach. Maybe it will work, maybe it won't, but if we want realistic solutions then we have to go back to open source. They didn't plan a new kind of society where all the software would be open source and then plan to build a huge project to showcase that? No. They started to reshape our current society by building non-proprietary software. And that's what our enemy opens the door towards. Anyone can, right now, start to fight against trade by creating trade-free stuff. From blocks to music, from providing food to providing help, from clothes to furniture, from this to that. Start to change the society right here and right now. No need to wait for anyone, no need to be part of a particular organization, no need for any of that. And that leads us to the last advantage of having trade as the enemy. The last point is about our enemy allows decentralized solutions. As mentioned before, if we fight the same enemy, then a solution to it is a solution for all of us involved in the fight. Organizations die, ideas survive. If our idea is to get rid of trade, then that will transcend organizations and eras, regimes and values, leaders and projects. You don't need me, anyone can fight this from any corner of the world. The Trump superhero said that we have to burst the trade bubble in order to get rid of it. The truth is you can't. You can only try to stay as far away from it as possible or in a sense push it away from societies. But to do that we need to first recognize that trade is the source of most problems so we have a common enemy in sight. Once that is done technologies and ideas will push humans away from the trade bubble through multiple solutions and through many years and through many attempts. And we will never reach a perfect trade-free society, only one where trades are mostly a thing of the past, much like infectious diseases are today. Therefore, we need technology, trade-free goods and services and ideas from all of you. I, the Trump superhero, am already doing this using all of my powers. 
I create trade-free services, technology and spread ideas about trade as the origin of most problems and what solutions there are to it. And now the kid comes back in again. Okay, I think I got it. I was expecting a step-by-step -step solution from you, but now I realize that this is not the way forward. We cannot rely on one single source to come up with solutions. We, the people, have to come up with solutions. Trump superhero adds, yes indeed. And then the kid says, I sure will. When this sinks in on you, the idea that Trey creates most of the world's problems, it's hard to not react to it and try to find a solution or multiple solutions for it. And then the Trump superhero says, okay kid, good luck and see you soon. We are teammates now. So the kid <laughs> goes out now um, and tells everyone about trade as the origin of most problems. Uh, he wants to make everyone aware of it. Goes into talk shows as we've seen right now. He goes into a church even, <laughs> that's funny. He tells it to families, to all kinds of people. Um, and yeah, he's just trying to raise awareness about this um, issue. And then five months in the future, like they are meeting again and just asking how, how is it going? <laughs> and the kid says, great, I'm fighting this trade every day. I made my own blog that's trade free. I had no ads, no trackers, nothing of the sort to it. And I recommend documentaries on my blog and books to people. All trade free. I don't expect anything in return. I talk to people about this enemy and I try to create some trade free services as much as I can. I'm spreading the word, Trom. How are you? Trom Zubiru says, this is so great to hear, honestly. As for me, I am great. Fighting the same fight. I'm trying to create trade free solutions and also educate the world about trade as the origin of most problems at the same time. Here is how. And now the Trump superhero will show two tools to the kid. One is the question mark, which is about detecting the trades. And the other one is the exclamation mark, which, is, um, which gives a way of how a good or service can be organized in a trade free manner. Um, so that will be super interesting, but we will discuss that in the next video. I hope this video was interesting for you and I'm just gonna say as always, goodbye, take care and much love. <laughs>